Today's lecture will be about limit cycles and more precisely I will recall definitions. I want to discuss the uh, von der Poel equations. And the third topic for today is the Hopf bifurcation. And it might be clear to you that this is all about ODEs in the plane. Okay, let's start with recalling a definition. So recall a solution, let's call it gamma t, of an ODE uh, x dots is f of x in Rd. Well, we think of d is equal to 2, but the definition works in every dimension. Uh, is a periodic solution of period t greater than 0 if after flowing for an extra time capital T, you're back where you start. And T is the smallest positive solution uh, with this property. And this property is exactly this one. So we want this to be a positive solution. Uh, so stationary points are in this parlance are not periodic solutions. Because we call them stationary points. So let's do an example. Uh, this is the simplest example I can think of that has uh, that has periodic solutions, and in fact, uh, this has. only periodic solutions and they encircle a single stationary point. So you might recall that is that this ODE is coming from the harmonic oscillator. Uh, which is the second order differential equation. With omega taken equal to 1. Now let's just draw the phase diagram as well. That will look very simple. Just the axis here. And there is a stationary point in the middle. And all the other solutions are circles around it. Another way of looking at this 
is by means of polar coordinates. Okay, so r squared is the usual x squared plus y squared. This is the x-axis, that is the y-axis, and y is the same as x dot. And uh, the other is the polar angle, that is the arc tangent of y divided by x. And then this vector field, which we still have somewhere, namely this one, takes the form uh, r dot is zero that's just differentiating this and plugging in the uh, differential equation and if you do the same for phi then the computation is a bit longer but the outcome is that uh, that uh, phi dot is minus one. And of course this implies that r is constant and this implies that phi t is some initial phi minus t and that shows that we are indeed uh, turning around in negative direction which is uh, clockwise rotations. Now all of these, except for the stationary point in the middle, are periodic solutions, but they are not what we call limit cycles, because limit cycles requires one extra condition, which we'll see now. So what is really a limit cycle? Well, a limit cycle is a periodic solution of an ODE that is isolated from all other periodic solutions. That is to say, and close to this periodic solution, you will not find any others. And in addition, we can, uh, well, we'll, we'll, we will uh, assume that that they are attracting in forward time but it is uh, also okay if they are repelling in forward time which is the same as attracting in backwards. Okay, to produce limit cycle, it's very easy to do so in polar coordinates. So examples easily produced in polar coordinates because then we can simply say something like this, r dot is r minus r squared, and phi dot, let's say it's one, or just as well minus one, well, let's do plus one. Um, as before, now if we just look at this, we have r is zero is a, Let's see, that is a stationary point, and I think it's a s unstable stationary point. 
And if you look at R is one, okay, that's another uh, station viewpoint. And now if R is a little bit bigger, this becomes negative. So indeed you go towards it. So this is a stable stationary, stationary point. Um, but if I look at uh, R2, because in the end this differential equation is in R2, uh, did this represents a circle of radius one, and that is a stable limit cycle. Okay, let's go back to Cartesian coordinates. How does it look then? Well, as follows. So x is r cos phi and y is r sine phi. So x dot, we have to differentiate. And uh, that's r dot cos phi minus r sine phi. And if we plug this in, we get that this is r dot is r minus r squared. And it turns out that r dot r, so r dot is r minus r squared. So here we have r cos phi, which is an x. And I have r squared cos phi is r times x, and the r squared has the minus sign. And this is, of course, just minus y. And if I do the same thing for y, then I get r dot sine phi plus r cos phi. And if I'm not mistaken, that is 1 minus r y plus x. Okay, so let's write this again. But now using a matrix. And now I got minus r and minus r is minus x squared plus y squared square root times x times y. So that's the form in, in polar coordinates. And I can look at the stationary points. Uh, there is a stationary point at um, 0, 0. And if you compute the eigenvalues, what do you get? It turns out that you get plus one, plus or minus i square root of two. So this is an unstable, because the real part is positive, spiral, because there is an imaginary part source. Well, unstable source is a bit of double. Uh, and at r is equal to one, uh, this equation reduces to, well, x dot, y dot, and now if r is 1, so this is 1, so I 
uh, subtract another x, I subtract another y, and what is left is here, this simple matrix, and this is as in the harmonic oscillator. So if r is equal to 1, we just get back to the harmonic oscillator and we know that we have periodic solution there. But in this case, because of this nonlinear term, it is the only uh, periodic solution. Okay. So uh, a historic remark. about Hilbert. Hilbert uh, was a mathematician who lived uh, or did his, uh, <clears throat> around 1900 and he was one of the foremost, if not the foremost mathematician of his time and precisely in the year 1900 he was invited to give a talk on the uh, International Congress of Mathematics and he decided to talk about problems that he would think or he thought would be important for the next century. And he listed altogether some 22 or 24 problems. But uh, problem number 16 is about limit cycle. Right so it's Hilbert's 16th problem. And I hope I can squeeze it in this here. Um, so for polynomial ODEs of degree N, let's just do it in R2, but he probably stated it in RD. What is the maximal number, let's call this Hn, of limit cycles? And now this problem is still open. That is to say, uh, We know some things, so for example, H1 is zero because linear systems do not have uh, limit cycles. Uh, it's like the harmonic oscillators, you might have loads of periodic solutions, but uh, no limit cycles because they're not isolated. Uh, for quadratic ones, we know that the number is at least four but uh, we still don't quite know an upper bound. And uh, as the degree of the polynomials increases, the number of limit cycles also increase. So for cubic polynomial ODEs, we know that you can get at least li 13 limit cycles, but also there we, not, uh, we do not know what the answer is. So also there we do not know what the actual value of H3 is. So let's start to look at the uh, van der Poel equation. Balthazar van der Poel was a Dutch electrical engineer who worked for Philips Labs between the wars and he was uh, involved in developing vacuum tubes and transistors uh, anything, anything what, uh, what the pioneering radio engineers needed to do. And later he was professor in Delft. Now you may recall from physics that electrical circuits give rise to oscillating behavior. So let's look at this differential equation, second order. And you might recognize 
the harmonic oscillator again, except that now there is this friction term over here. And this friction term takes a bit strange uh, form. This is friction term. Uh, namely, if x squared is less than 1, then it's negative friction. Uh, whereas if x bigger than is positive friction, and that's the type of friction that we usually see. So for large values of x, x squared larger than 1, we think of seeing a proper friction term, and that would mean that the solutions uh, become smaller and smaller and will eventually die out at the origin, uh, whereas uh, negative friction would be the other uh, alternative. That would mean that for small values of x, uh, more and more energy is pumped into the system, so the origin where x is zero is actually unstable. Nearby orbit will start to spiral away from the origin. And so that means we get a kind of phase diagram as follows. Let, let's first try to rewrite this. Star as uh, a first order ODE in R2. And that looks like, well, X dot is a new coordinate Y and Y dot is, yeah, what shall we take? Uh, minus X plus epsilon 1 minus x squared y. And let's call this the vector field. And also assume that at x0, so at time 0, we have an initial value that I want to denote as x bar. And y0 is simply 0. So these are initial values. Okay, so maybe here on the right I can squeeze in the face portrait. So here's x, here is y, and uh, so there is obviously a stationary point. And if we want to do the proper analysis, then we have to look at the derivative of this vector field. Well, that's a matrix that looks like this. And this differentiating to x gives 2 epsilon x uh, times y. And with respect to y, you get this. And that means that if I plug in 0, 0, it becomes simpler. Uh, yes, 1 minus 1. Here I only have epsilon. Uh, and this has eigenvalues you can compute. Uh, lambda is epsilon over 2 plus or minus. 1 over 2 square root of, if I'm not mistaken, is this. Okay. Now, if epsilon is not too big, this is negative, so we get complex eigenvalues, but the real part, uh, the real part is when epsilon for positive epsilon is also positive, that is, it is unstable. Uh, so, unstable spiral.
Okay, so let's draw that in. That's basically the behavior near zero. But that other argument, then when x squared is very large, that I have positive friction, that seems to suggest that if I have uh, solutions that start very far away from the origin, that they have to spiral inwards. So from the origin they go outwards, from far out they go inwards, and yeah, somewhere in between there has to be some periodic solution that doesn't know if it has to go outwards or inwards and therefore stays where it is. Uh, that is at least, and in fact only one, we'll see later, one limit cycle. Okay, let us analyze this Van der Poel system. I put it down again here in the differential equation here as the vector field. And we first analyze it for very small values of epsilon and the technique that we're going to use is called multi-scale analysis. And that means we're going to make the following ansatz that our solution will have the following form. It's going to be a power series in epsilon where the coefficients are going to be functions of t, which I call x, k. And then we're going to solve this differential equation uh, according to the powers of epsilon. So we can start with uh, the zero of power, and that means uh, epsilon terms are not present, only epsilon to the power zero, which is, uh, which is just one. And then we get, uh, if we rewrite this vector field, we get the following form, x zero dot dot plus x zero is zero. And the initial conditions are that x0 at time 0 is x bar and x0 dot is 0. Now, fortunately, this is not so difficult to solve. It's just a harmonic oscillator. And that gives that x0 of t is the initial condition times the cos of t. And that means that the derivative is simply minus x bar sine of t. Okay, so that's the zero of power. And then we go on with the, uh, with the first power. So now we're going to take the linear terms in epsilon. Okay. So the differential equation will now indeed have an epsilon here, and this will be x0, because otherwise I would get epsilon squared, and also this would be x0 dot. But here and here we put in x1, so what we get is x1 times epsilon minus epsilon 1 minus x0 squared x0 dot plus x1 dot, with an epsilon, is zero. And the initial values 
Well, uh, we already used the x bar for the x0, so for x1 at time 0, there's nothing left. And that's the same for the derivative. Okay, so here we have a differential equation. Uh, so what I'm going to do is insert the solution of this one into the solution where epsilon has the power 1. Uh, so I'm going to insert the results for into and this should be epsilon 1 and cancel epsilon okay if I do that then I get the following equation uh, x1 dot dot plus x1 is x bar x bar squared cos squared minus 1 the whole fine times sine of t and uh, I can use a trick formula trigonometry namely cos squared t sine t is actually the same as a quarter of sine t plus sine sorry sine 3 times t if I use that then this can be simplified to become x bar x bar squared over 4 minus 1 sine of t plus x bar squared over 4 sine 3t. Okay, let's look at this. So the left hand side again looks like the harmonic oscillator, but now we have a right side uh, hand side. And uh, usually in the right hand side we get some kind of a driving force. But this is a periodic driving force, and namely with frequency. And uh, not just the frequency, the same, because here is a sine t, and over here we also had sine t and cos t, so the frequency the same as the what I would like to call the natural frequency of x0. And this phenomenon creates resonance. And resonance means in practice that solutions will increase over time and actually I don't like that because um, if solutions will increase over time that is to say this x1 will increase over time uh, then x1 might be even though it's multiplied by a very small epsilon might actually grow bigger than the x0 which didn't have an epsilon so somehow this is not so very nice, uh, but let's see what we get if we solve this differential equation. Now, this differential equation can be solved. It's not so simple. So what I will do is simply write down the solution and then verify that that is indeed the correct solution. Okay, I cleared 
the board a bit and recall that this is the differential equation for x1 and I want to solve it. And I said I would solve it by simply writing down what the solution is and then checking that that is indeed correct. So this was star one and the solution to star one is claimed to be, okay, uh, x1 of t equals Thirty-two. Okay, so I claim that this is the solution, and yeah, uh, if I look at this, well, this is nicely oscillating. It doesn't increase. This is nicely oscillated, but this is the resonance term. This is the term that will grow over time. And this is the term that will make our ansatz in, invalid. So somehow we need to deal with that term. But let's first check that this is indeed the correct solution. So for that, I need to compute the derivative. Okay, there we go. I can simply copy this. And now the derivative of this one is cos t minus cos t plus t sine over t. And this uh, has a derivative similar. So this is 3 cos t minus 3 cos 3t. And of course, these two cos times cancel. So if I take the next derivative, I don't have to worry about it. I just have to look at the remaining term that is t sine t. And if I take the derivative there, I get uh, t cos t plus sine t and here, If I'm not mistaken, I get minus 3 cos t minus, no, plus 9 sine 3t. Okay, and now I'm going to add them up. I'm going to add them up. Add is to say this one and this one, and not this one. And then I get the second derivative plus the zero derivative is what? So this one, uh, ah, uh, and you will always see that it will not quite Bit. Ah, it does. So this one will cancel with this one, and this one, and this one will give 2 times sine t, um, but I have a t there, so those that 2 that I get here cancels with this, and, and I have the first term. And now for the second one, this 3t uh, sine minus... Ah, I see I made a mistake. If I differentiate, I 
would get sine over here. And that means that this one is actually going to cancel with this. And this one gives me minus plus nine is altogether eight times sine three t, eight divided by 32 is indeed a quarter. So yes, this is indeed the solution. Okay, so uh, what do I do now? Um, yes, I'm going to look at this resonance term. Uh, I don't like the resonance terms. Uh, so a resonance term is problematic but it disappears if x bar is 2. Because look at this one. If x bar is 2, then this is 0 for x bar is 2. And that means that the ansatz can be carried out if my initial condition x bar is 2. And that means ansatz is valid then. And the limit cycle is in fact Okay, so I want to have a different approach to this same problem, trying to find out for very small values of epsilon when or at what amplitude the, uh, uh, the limit cycle has. And that I can also do with some energy consideration for which I need to clean the board. Okay, I promised a different approach, um, which is a bit less computation. So let's say we have the kinetic energy, energy, uh, let's call it E, and assume that this is x squared plus x dot squared, the whole thing divided by 2. And then we can call or compute the Lie derivative, which is basically the time derivative of this quantity E. And that is simply x times x dot plus x dot x double dot. Okay, so here we can pull an x dot outside the brackets and we get x plus x double dot there and that's also here that is this plus this so this is going to be epsilon times x dot times 1 minus x square and an other x dot so here's a square okay So we start again using this ansatz and this notation of x0, uh, where this is a cos t, and this is the initial amplitude of the solution. And substitute. If we do that, then we get that this derivative dE dt is in fact epsilon a squared x dot. That gives me a 
sine. If I take the derivative here, that gives a sine. I had the square there. And then 1 minus x square gives another a square cos t squared. Okay. Now, if this is supposed to be a periodic solution, so if x0 of t is periodic, uh, well, the period is going to be 2 pi. If I, I, if I look at that, the cosine has appeared 2 pi. Uh, then integrating... And the derivative of the energy over one period should give zero. Because uh, integrating the derivative over a period of time I uh, would say I'm looking at the difference between the value of the energy at the end and the value at the energy of the beginning. But if they are the same point, then they have to be, that difference has to be zero. And that means that I get the following integral equation. Zero is zero from zero to two pi d e d t d t. And then I plug in what this is. So that gives me an epsilon a squared, the integral from 0 to 2 pi, sine squared d dt minus, well, maybe I best put the dt at the very end. Uh, minus a squared sine squared cos squared and the whole thing dt. Okay, I still have to compute some integrals, but this is sine squared, and I guess you have seen that before. If you integrate it over the whole period, what comes out is simply pi. And here I can use some doubling formula. This is actually uh, the sine of 2t, the whole thing squared. And same reasoning gives that this is a squared over a half squared times the same pi, which is a squared pi 1 minus a squared over 4. And if this is supposed to be 0, then we find that the amplitude is again 4. And that means if we go back to this picture, the radius that we find for this limit cycle when epsilon is very small is exactly 2. So now I want to continue with the von der Poel equation, uh, this time for epsilon large. And the technique is quite different. This is, uh, the notion is called a relaxation, relaxation oscillation. Okay, so I have the differential equation again. And what I want to use is something called a Lyonard transform, Lyonard. Is a French guy, obviously, or maybe Belgium, I don't know. <coughs> and that's the following form. There's a new coordinate, W, which is epsilon x cubed over 3 minus x plus x dot. Okay, so now this thing in the brackets, I want to call f of x. And uh, 
this transformation gives me something new. So uh, x dot is w minus f of x. And that is just by rewrite Leonard transformation. And the y, oops, that's going to be a w dot. Y dot is only later. And that turns out to be minus x. And this is from star. It's just if you write x double dot as a subject, you get exactly what is written here. <coughs> uh, if you work it out. So that's the uh, new transform. And uh, the next step is to take a new coordinate y is w over epsilon. And recall that epsilon is large. So y is now the small coordinate. Okay, so in this coordinate you get x dot is, well, if y is epsilon over epsilon, then w is epsilon times y. And there's another epsilon, so I can write it like this with brackets. And y dot is minus x dot divided by epsilon, and this is the small coordinate. Okay, so maybe we can find the phase diagram of this one. So the phase portrait. Let's again draw the axis. Here's x, here is y, which is in fact whatever it is. And uh, it helps me to consider in this picture uh, the null Klein for x. That is to say, for which set of coordinates x and y is the x coordinate, or x dot equal to 0, well, that is when y is the same as f of x. That is to say, y is f of x, and f of x is written here. So what we get here is a cubic formula that looks like this. And that's the null Klein for x. So that means that x dot there is zero. That means that the vector field is in fact vertical. So this is the vector field. Okay. Okay, then you can look at the y coordinate uh, when it's positive or negative. Um, and what seems to be the case is that y is positive. So if x is positive, so on this part of the plane, then I get a minus x. Right, I see. Shall I just cross this out and replace this by x over epsilon? Because I do not have an x dot there. Uh, so here it becomes negative. Right. Uh, elsewhere on the plane, um, yeah, well, above this purple cor uh, curve, then y minus f of x is positive. And we know that epsilon is large, so the x dot will be quite large. So that means a large horizontal component. So it will look like this. Whereas below the curve, below the purple null line, uh, the x dot becomes negative. So we get. this behavior. 
Okay. Now imagine what if we had some initial position. Let's say we have start here. Now what it does is it follows the vector field. Now here the movement is strongly to the um, uh, in, in a horizontal direction, so it goes very rapidly towards the null climb. But at the null climb, the movement is vertical. And over here it's upward. So this curve will kind of move here and follow the null climb. And does this, in fact, very, very slowly because the values of x dot is very small. Y dot, because epsilon is large, is also small. So the movement is extremely slow here. And then here, it can finally release this purple curve and go above it. And immediately what happens is that the horizontal component takes over and it rapidly goes here. But here, it has to follow the null climb again. And go down very, this is very fast. But here it's very slow, just like here. And we get this behavior until here. And then it is released again from the null climb. And that's what's called the relaxation. And it speeds to the other side and continues here. So we get this oddly shaped limit cycle. Uh, which is called a uh, the shape of a canard. Well, canard is just duck in French. And how you can recognize a duck in that shape is almost beyond me. But if you look at the website uh, for our course, then I do a picture there, or I copy the picture, uh, with the duck drawn in. So if you're really curious why this is a canard, uh, look there and you will be enlightened. Okay, so this is what I want to tell about what happens if epsilon is large. If a very large epsilon, the limit cycle in these coordinates will look like this. And the movement along this limit cycle uh, is alternating very slow and then very quick to the other side and then it's slow again because we're very close to the null line and then rapidly to the right and so on and so forth. And if you look at the arrows in this picture, you can also see that it is stable because when you're away from it, the arrows always point towards it. So you just have to go to this limit cycle. And it also shows that there is a unique limit cycle. So that's uh, what I wanted to say about the Van der Poel equation. And the next topic uh, is also about limit cycles. It's about the bifurcation that can produce limit cycles. And that bifurcation is called the Hopf bifurcation. Okay, the Hopf bifurcation. Uh, this is named after uh, Eberhard Hopf, who was actually an Austrian. He was born in uh, Salzburg in the beginning of the 20th century. And he did quite some work some in the early developments of ergodic theory as well, as well as bifurcation theory. So here is uh, a differential equation which is supposed to exhibit a Hopf bifurcation. So first some remark, uh, uh, a Hopf bifurcation is in fact a pitchfork in polar coordinates. So this bifurcation is not so entirely new as you might think. And secondly, note 
the difference in the position of epsilon in the equation I mean, this looks like uh, it looks like the uh, uh, the Van der Poel equation, but it is not because the epsilon is over here and not in front of it. So it's really a different equation, and naturally uh, the behavior is also quite different. So as usual, we introduce. Uh, a second coordinate, y is simply x dot, and then we write the system to half x dot is then y, and y dot is, well, what would it be? Uh, minus x, minus x squared minus epsilon times y. And this is the vector field that I have for this particular equation. Well, it's clear that there is a stationary, stationary point at the origin. So let's compute what df of x, y is. That's this matrix, 0, 1. Minus 1 minus uh, xy, actually 2xy, and the epsilon is sitting here. So if I try to do this at the origin, what I get out of this is minus 1 plus epsilon with eigenvalues. Lambda plus or minus is epsilon over 2 plus a half epsilon squared minus 4. So this is positive, this is negative, it's going to be an imaginary number with a positive real part, and therefore uh, we get uh, that 0, 0 is a spiraling. source. Okay. Uh, well, at least for epsilon positive. Uh, and that's precisely what we need to do, eh? uh, because we want to see what happens if epsilon goes through zero. So I can draw the three pictures again, the three face portraits, what I expect to see uh, when epsilon is zero, when epsilon is positive, and when epsilon is negative. Okay. Um, So first, let's look what happens if epsilon is negative. If epsilon is negative, then what I said here about spiraling source is reversed because epsilon is negative. So this is going to be a spiraling sink. So uh, zero, zero is even a hyperbolic sink. And what happens globally? Yeah, again, uh, if epsilon is negative, this is all positive. So you get a positive friction term. And physics tells us that then globally, the solutions have to spiral to zero. So this is not just locally, but even globally spiraling to zero. Okay. Now if epsilon is zero, then this is still globally spiraling inwards, but you can see the smaller x, the less the friction. So the spiraling inwards will go slower and slower. So we will have that zero, zero is a neutral 
uh, sync. But still globally, and I think the way to draw is, is like this. So it spirals in, but I hope you get the impression that this goes much slower than otherwise. And then for epsilon is positive, then this is indeed this spiraling source. So we get this. And it's also hyperbolic. But if x is large, then x squared is much larger than epsilon, so we get this positive friction term. So we do expect global behavior moving inwards. And then we have this friction again between outwards from the origin, inwards from far away, and somewhere in between. There is going to be a limit cycle. And that's what we want to show. Okay, so I cleaned the board, rewrote the vector field that belongs to this differential equation that I wrote down. And now we're going to use polar coordinates So, uh, r squared is x squared plus y squared, which implies that 2r r dot is 2x x dot plus 2y y dot. <coughs> and this can be rewritten as uh, 2r uh, cos phi. dot plus 2 r sine phi y dot uh, so r dot is simply x dot cos phi plus y dot sine phi okay now the other one is uh, phi is the arc tangent of y over x, and that gives phi dot is, yeah, this is using the chain rule a couple of times. And here we have y dot times x minus x dot y times x squared. And this simplifies, if I multiply everything out, numerator and denominator by x squared, then the first factor simply becomes 1 over x squared plus y squared. And the thing in the brackets becomes x, y dot, minus y dot. So I'm going to insert in the vector field of star, and that gives me the new one, r dot is in fact epsilon r sine squared phi minus r cubed sine squared phi cos squared phi, and phi dot is minus one, just as in the harmonic oscillator, but I get an other term. And even further other terms. Okay. Now we want to use an ansatz. What we are after is to find a periodic solution uh, as there is a periodic solution which I want to call R0, which is R0 as function of phi. And this is for epsilon is much less than R0 
which again much less than one. So both epsilon and R0 are small, but epsilon even smaller than R0. And yeah, then uh, I would like to know what the derivative of this R0 is with respect to phi. Okay, so R0 is supposed to depend on phi, but in first instance it depends on time. So I can write this as uh, dr dt and then use the chain rule dt d phi. But this is simply r dots. Zero is everywhere. And dt d phi is the inverse of d phi dt and that is phi dot. Okay, so I have to take the fraction, the quotient of these two things. All right, now what would that look like? And I want to structure all these things according to powers of epsilon and powers of r, where the smallest coefficients, sorry, the smallest exponents are used first. So that means I take r dot and I basically divide by minus one. And that gives me minus epsilon r zero phi uh, sine squared phi plus r zero cubed of phi sine squared of phi cos squared of phi And all the other ones are basically obtained by what else is in phi dot. So I'm dividing by phi dot, but dividing by minus one plus something is basically the same as multiplying by minus one plus something. And that something is this times the thing that I already had. So here this epsilon times Epsilon here becomes epsilon squared r. And this thing r squared times epsilon becomes epsilon r cubed, in fact. And here there's r to the fifth. So I can write this as a big O uh, of terms that look like epsilon squared times r or like um epsilon r cubed or even like r to the fifth that is the all kind of terms that are much smaller uh, than the terms that i had on the first line <clears throat> okay now i was hoping that this is a periodic solution so For r0 of phi to be a periodic solution, what I need is that 0 is, in fact, the integral over a whole period of uh, the r0 of phi d phi, d phi. This is basically the same argument that I had a half an hour ago. Uh, if this is a periodic solution, uh, if you integrate over one period, you will see the value at 2 pi minus the value at 0, because, but if these are the same values, that difference should be 0. Okay, so that explains this equality sign. And now I simply have to compute what, is, what I'm doing here. And, and at this moment, I'm going to think that, well, R0 is almost constant. So I'm not going to worry more about uh, that R0 is uh, an, a, a, a function of phi, but I'm going to say if R0 is constant. Okay, so that means that uh, in this derivative, 
I'm just going to treat this as a constant and I'm going to treat this as a constant. Uh, I only have these things about sine phi and sine phi squared. So I get that this is epsilon sine squared of phi minus uh, r0 squared sine squared of phi cos squared of phi uh, plus the big O terms of all these things that I had here and which I will not copy. Um, but if I do that integral, uh, what follows? Okay. Ah, I've seen that integral before too. Uh, sine squared integrated over zero pi, uh, to pi, and that gives me pi times epsilon. And ah, I see that one before as well. That was this doubling formula. This was sine. This was a half sine two phi, the whole thing squared, and that gives me pi r zero squared divided by four. Okay, uh, plus this big O term of things that are supposed to be smaller than the things in the first term, so I can ignore them. And if this is zero, then this implies that the leading term has to be zero. And when is the leading term zero? Well, I can cancel pi, I guess epsilon minus r zero squared over four. So that means that r zero is the square root of 2 epsilon. Uh, so this is the radius of the uh, limit cycle that appears in a Hopf bifurcation. So this is an uh, argument why we uh, will see a limit cycle and we also uh, know more or less what size the uh, radius of this limit cycle will have. So uh, on the next board, I would like to kind of summarize uh, the Hopf bifurcation, not only for ODEs, but also for maps um, using uh, normal polar forms.